Final Hour Overdrive continues, brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line of the final score. Brian Hayes, the O'Dog, Jeff O'Neill, Jonas Siegel of The Athletic. Day one of the Masters is underway down at Augusta National. We're tracking the leaderboard where Bryson DeChambeau is in a clubhouse at 7-under, but Scotty Scheffler is 6-under through 16. Um, I mean, the guy's just an absolute machine. All the hype, all the talk, all the chatter, all the Tiger comparisons, and look what he's doing. You've got uh, Corey Connors, T6 right now at 2-under. Good Canadian boy. My boy, what did I tell you? What did I say? Corey is absolutely ready to rock at Augusta. I get it. I get it. Does that say 6 for Scheffler? Yeah, he's 6-under. Oh, watch out, man. Exactly. Like, the 6-under today, he'll be 10 or 11-under by tomorrow. I mean, guys have said it, and we, they were, we were talking about Brandel Chamblee said earlier in the week, and a lot of people are like, nah, get out of here. He said he might run away and win this by seven or eight strokes. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, I hope that's not the case. I don't want to see that be the case. But this is Tiger levels of dominance. Yeah. Like, he, he wins the players. He wins the Arnie Palmer. He almost won in Houston. Now look at him first round of Augusta National. This guy is in the zone at a ridiculous rate. Like, ridiculous. He, just has, to, he has to putt above average, and he's going to win the way he's striking the ball. Yeah. And with the par fives being such an impactful part of the tournament, it just seems like it'll be driver, four iron, or five iron, mm-hmm. and two putt birdies. Yeah, fun. Well, yeah. What's interesting is McElroy, he just bogeyed 17, but he's one under, which is great for him. If you can survive Thursday, if you're McElroy, you're in it. You know, it's yeah. always been Thursday. He's always been three over, four over, five over in his tournament. And he shoots 65 to make the cut on Friday. Yep. And then it, it's like, oh, is Rory. But it's crazy how he hasn't found his groove at that golf course. Like, yeah, that place is tailor-made for that guy. Yeah, it is. It is. But he's he's one under. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of big names up there. Homa's two under. He's out there. Tyrrell Hatton, Snap Show, he's out there. Fitz, he's at two under. Will Zalatoris, two under. Neiman, two under. Um, your boy Matt Pavon is three under, and he's on the front. Matty Pavon. <laughs> he's like he he won at Pebble, I think it was. Like this guy loves classic golf. Oh, no, he won. Uh, is it Tory Pines? Tory Pines. He won. Yeah. He almost won again the next week at Pebble. Though. Yeah, he did. Anyway, um, all right. JP Ricciardi coming up here in a moment. So the Mariners end up beating the Jays last night, and Cal Raleigh came out after the game. And I guess admitted that he had heard John Schneider's commentary on him last year where, where John was a pretty good shot at him. Like he, he, well, he, he called the spade a spade in terms of his numbers, but he basically said, and paraphrasing here to an extent, but if you, if you, if you pitch to the game plan, he's not a tough guy to face. Execute. Exactly. If you execute, he's not a tough guy to face. And he referenced, he's hitting around 200. Like he kind of took a shot. Those are stats, though. You got to own those. And then Raleigh obviously did what he did, and then he came out after the game and admitted that he had heard that and that he's not a fan of John Schneider and that he has sources, I guess, or buddies around the league that share in that sentiment, that there's a lot of guys in the league that don't like John Schneider. Well, maybe he's a mouthpiece in the dugout, but I don't understand why you would want to – like, it's just why fire up other people? You're, you're the manager. You're the skip. Mm-hmm. It's like – you want to start having beef with other players, and I like a guy being intense, but leave the other players alone. Let Vladdy and Bo and the star players George Springer deal with that. You don't have to start chirping players. Mm-hmm. I used to have assistant coaches that would just just give it to me on the bench, and I'm like, "What's your problem? <laughs> like, you're you're the assistant coach." Yeah, like, and- it's like what what do you what is your deal? Right. And and here he's the manager. It's not an over. It is an emotional sport, but nowhere near as emotional as hockey or football. So I don't know how motivating it really is. Like Cal Raleigh isn't going to hit three fifty now the rest of his career because John Schneider does have pretty good numbers against the Jays. Right, and I guess that's why he was originally posed the question: Why is it an issue for you guys, where it doesn't seem to be an issue for many other teams around baseball? I don't think it should matter necessarily if you're a Blue Jay fan. That other, Who cares if other players and teams don't like John Schneider? If anything, I think this will play pretty well in the market. That's great. But I think the point that you make, O, is really what matters here, is if it is going to motivate in any way or possibly put your team in a bad place, 
then it's not a smart move. The comments yeah, are unless so a innocuous. player does on the other opposition does something crazy stupid comment, but mm-hmm. I hate. I love coaches saying that guy's not my player. I'm not commenting on him. Yeah. It's, it's not my guy. Unless there's something egregious where he sucker punches somebody or there's different things like that. But zero comment on opposition players. Right. Not needed. And Steiner's still relatively young. You know, yeah. he, he it's is. Like, it's his second full year. Who are you to be doing this stuff? Right. And and I think that's what Raleigh took issue with is that you, you, you referenced his stats and said that if you execute – it's an easy out. Isn't that like, yeah. true of anyone? Yeah, but the, it's one thing to say we executed, so we got like in the moment. It's one thing to be like we we pitched them really well tonight, we got them, and we felt good about our game plan. It's another thing to be like, basically insinuating that guy stinks, and we're going to get him. You know, like there there does seem to be some nuance there that leans towards why a player would take issue, whether it's true or not. Other players around the league hate on John Schneider. I'm not sure it matters, but should it matter to the Blue Jays? Would it matter to Ross Atkins? Would it matter to J.P. Ricciardi if he was the GM of the Blue Jays? Let's ask him here. He's got his podcast out, host of the Brushback with J.P. Here's J.P. Ricciardi. How you doing, J.P.? Good. How you guys doing? Yeah, we're doing well. We're just talking about this Cal Raleigh stuff from last night where he was in town with the Mariners, and he uh, referenced a comment that John Schneider made about him last year where John basically said, we feel if we execute against him, we will – we will strike him out. We will get him out. He's an easy out. He only hits 200, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Cal didn't like it. Cal suggested other players in the, around the league don't like John Schneider. Um, is this a story that should matter to the Blue Jays? I think if you make it a story in the clubhouse, it's a story. But, you know, turn the page and move on. Uh, it's probably something he shouldn't have said. And, you know, players are always looking for something to fire him up. And uh, obviously the guys played well against Toronto. So uh, maybe not the comment you want to say about a player who's doing well against you, but Mm -hmm. uh, it's done. It's over. You just move on, you know? Right. But in terms of Schneider and his reputation, you know, if he's known as a guy that's, you know, popping off a little bit fiery, um, I kind of like that, but how do you feel about it? And what, what kind of attributes, characteristics do you think are ideal for a manager in the modern game? Well, I think John's a young manager, and, you know, when you're a young manager, you're cutting your teeth, and you're open to interpretation of what people think about you. But, you know, once you have some success, look, I remember watching Terry Francona manage the Phillies, and I was scouting the the big leagues at the time, and the Phillies weren't a very good team, and, and Terry was not a very good manager at the time because he was cutting his teeth at the major league level. So he went on to become a great manager and a future Hall of Fame manager, but if you pass judgment on Terry Francona as a young manager compared to what he ended up being, it would be two different stories. So I think, you know, until John gets to that point where he's solidified and has had some, some success and some results, uh, I think his reputation is being formed in, in different aspects from different angles. And it's just part of being a young manager. What do you think of some of the decision making from the manager, David Schneider? People come out to me all the time. They're like, "Oh, David Schneider, he's hot. He's just going to get sat out the next game." What do you think of that, JP? Some of those lineup decisions where a guy's hot, but they have different matchups and analytics where they go to and say, "It's best for you not to play today." Well, I think that's a question you have to ask the the front office. Uh, you know, some of these managers are beholden to what they're told from above and they're really in no position to push back you know unless you're a brian snitker or a a bruce bochy you know a guy with a lot of experience and has had some success i think all the younger managers have to deal with lineups being dictated to them to a certain degree and i think you know maybe john can't even answer those questions sometimes because you know he's not going to sell out the people above him that are telling him to to make the lineup out, but I, you know, I, I have a hard time when you're struggling understanding how you don't have a guy in there who's might be one of the only hot guys in the in the lineup. So I, I don't think that's John's decision all the way. That would be my guess. Yeah, I, I think most people would concede that and kind of understand that that's where that's where the modern game is in in large part uh, with JP Ricciardi. Interesting story coming out in, in terms of, you know, Scott Boris and his stranglehold on this sport where there are reports now that Jordan Montgomery, who was his client, is about to drop him as an agent. And Montgomery was 
was one of the famous Boris for this offseason that included Chapman, Matt Chapman, Cody Bellinger, Blake Snell. All four of them waited a long time to get a deal. None of them got long-term deals, really. I mean, I guess Bellinger maybe likes his deal. But, um, and again, this is Montgomery, who's coming off a great season. Had to wait a long time, took a deal in Arizona, clearly maybe didn't love, and he's going to drop Boris. Boris has been the prominent agent in baseball and pro sports for years, for decades. Do you think he's, is he losing his grip? What, what do you make of this Montgomery story, the offseason, and where Boris comes into play on all this? I don't know if he's losing his grip. I think what's happening is front offices just don't adhere to, you know, giving in to long-term contracts, big long-term contracts anymore. Uh, you know, you see a few of them. Obviously, Otani's the exception. But I think some of these, the players that you're talking about, teams didn't want to go the, the years that maybe he, he thought were that deserving of the players. So I think what he's going to run into now is front offices – that push back a little bit and don't cave in to being that one team that gives them the the five or six or seven year deal. So, you know, therein lies probably a challenge for him and his players. Uh, I think if you asked all those players separately, I don't think any of them were happy waiting until the season started to get signed. That just throws off your clock. And it's going to be interesting to see how those guys perform early in the season, not having that spring training underneath them, you know, I don't care how good you are. It's hard to miss spring training. So, I don't know. It's a it's a new landscape, and it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Well, so, JP. JP sorry, oh, Jeff. sorry, go ahead, Jonas. Well, I was just going to say, so you actually think that there is, like, a shifting landscape? Because, like, one of the guys who's come up here is, like, Brandon Belt, pretty good hitter last year, unsigned. Like, do you think something has really changed with front offices? Oh, yeah. you don't think it has? I don't know. It's so bizarre. I mean, look, look, at, look at the way... Look at the way the game's being run. You, you've got guys that can't go more than three innings. You've got a game that used to used to say a pitcher that could command the ball, we can get him to do more things. Now we've got guys throwing 95, 97 who can't command the ball, and all they're doing is getting hurt. We have lineups dictated by front offices. We have drafts dictated by front offices. Where do you want to? You know, where do you want me to stop? So. Why, why is in the front office, they're going to look at all these players and use them as commodities. And I'm sure the Blue Jays would have loved to have Chapman, but they probably looked at it and said, not worth the three or four years. So I think front offices, in some ways, are getting smarter, but in some ways, they're adhering to being fiscally responsible looking down the road. You know, look at Sander Bogarts, great player, but would you give him 10 years for that money? No way. What's the end of that contract going to look like? Yeah. Well, yeah. isn't the scenario always can you win something during that 10 years? Because the GM, doesn't. don't they have the philosophy, JP, that they're not going to be around for the back end of it anyway? Yeah, but that's kind of a – that's a lousy business practice, I think, you know? That's not mine. I'm keep... just saying. I, I, I think that's what their mentality is. Yeah, but that, that's, you just answered your own question. That's why teams aren't doing it, because organizations are saying, why do we want to be hamstrung four years into this down the road when he's, he's going to be a, a declining player? So that's where I think front offices are. I wouldn't say they're getting smarter. They're just getting more, um, I guess, frugal with their money. With J.P. Ricciardi, you, you referenced there a number of things that have changed you know, over the years, and one of them is starting pitchers can't go more than three innings. And I was reading something last week that one, when Kershaw, Verlander, and Scherzer hang them up, they're all first ballot, lock, unanimous Hall of Famers and going in. After that, who is a Hall of Fame starting pitcher? Like, who, who is, and, and do we have to adjust, and will we adjust how we look at starting pitchers in terms of Cooperstown? Because no one's no one's going to throw you know a million innings anymore. No one's getting to 300 wins anymore. Strikeouts they're high, but you don't pitch enough innings probably to accumulate enough. You know, like guys are winning Cy Youngs with 191 innings and maybe 200 strikeouts. Like, how how far is it going in that direction where we are going to have to adjust even the merits of becoming a a Hall of Fame starting pitcher? Well, until an organization decides that they want to develop starting pitching 
and they realize that some guys can get through the lineup three times, uh, I don't think it's going to change. I think five, ten years from now, you can go to the Smithsonian in Washington and there will be a picture of Bob Gibson up there and they'll say, this is what a starting pitcher used to look like. Mm-hmm. You know, they're just they're obsolete. And we've created it. The game has created it. They're still out there, but they're being sold a bill of goods that they can't be starting pitchers based on this, this, and this. And I don't think that's true. I mean, I look at our rotation in Toronto. We had Sean Markham, Ted Lilly, A.J. Burnett, and Doc. Yep. How would you like to face those guys in the playoffs? You know, our problem was we, we didn't have the expanded playoffs, but we always thought if we got to a three-game series and Doc pitches two of those three, good luck trying to beat us. Mm-hmm. And now what organization do you look at? You hope, oh, geez, this guy's an opener. Well, I hope he gets through the first. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. just think it's – we're wrecking the game. We're wrecking the game. It's, uh, it's really sad what the game's become. You go to a game now, you look up. I don't know the last time you've been into a big league game, but go look at the scoreboard. And it's like taking an MIT ent- entrance exam. You know, I don't want to look at Woba and Babbitt and Angle and this. I, I, I want to go to a game and be entertained and watch the game myself and be able to say, I can dictate what happened by watching what I, I saw. I just saw a really nice play. Yeah. I just saw a ball go off the wall. I don't need someone to tell me it was 110. It was hit hard. And I think we've just gotten away. We're creating we're, – we're, we're pandering to the fans that I don't even think they go to the game looking at that stuff. Yeah. I'm, I hear you, man. I'm, I, you're preaching to the choir here uh, because you're right. Baseball. Well, I think we've lost, uh, we've, we've lost our entertainment, uh, our viewpoint on entertainment, you know, and, and I don't know how old you guys are or whatever, but you know, I remember going and seeing uh, Jim Lombard's pitching. He was a 1967 Cy Young award winner. Pedro Martinez is pitching. Uh, Roger Clemens is pitching, you know, who does the kid sit there and say, hey, Dad, let's go to the game today? Uh, the Open is pitching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. You know, we, we, I, it's, I think that, that case is always was what was against Jack Morris, but Jack Morris was a guy when he was in town and he was pitching, you're like, I'm going to see Jack Morris. And that guy's going to pitch a lot yeah. of innings and throw with heat and have an attitude. But his ERA was what it was or his you know, underlying numbers, and he was mean to some people. So, you know, you're not getting in. Like, that's kind of the way it worked. Um, yeah, it's sad. It's, it's sad because we're, we're, we're really taken away from our product where it still is a great game. But like you said, I mean, when Verlander and Scherzer and, and DeGrom go away, who are the starters that you say, wow, mm-hmm. this is, you know, you're a young kid and you're a pitcher and you, you want to emulate these guys. You want to watch how they warm up. You want to watch everything about them. So, yeah, you know, I think we're really, we're killing our game. Uh, the podcast is The Brushback with JP. He is JP Ricciardi. Appreciate it. As always, JP, we'll do it again soon. Okay, guys. Take care. There's uh, JP Ricciardi out for is a hike, a, I think. <laughs> was he doing a superset? Yeah, he was. He might have been working out. I don't know. Him and Tom Brady. He sounds like he's team I test. That You know what, though? I think what he is is he's team entertainment. And, and what... I think he's speaking on behalf of is he's looking at the fans and I think he's a hundred percent correct. If you're in management, you need to know everything. You need to be informed. You need to know every single possible analytic. Of course you do, but it's gotten way too carried away to the point where now I just, it's tough to have baseball conversations with, with baseball, dude, no kidding. Like freakish number guys who are like, well, wait a minute. That guy's not that I'm like, I don't know, man. He stole a base. He had a couple of hits. Yeah. But if you look at his exit velocity, it's like, what about that? It was a fun game and the guy won and it was a really fun night. What about just a thundering hit off the wall? Instead, it's the exit velo. It's like, yeah, that doesn't need to be brought up there. Right. Well, look at like Vladdy hit that home run and home runs are different because you can, you can put a number on the distance, which is kind of cool. Right. But what happens is these numbers have been manipulated the other way where Vladdy will hit into a double play and it will be, yeah, but did you see how hard he hit it? So he got unlucky. Okay. But it's a double play. He hit it to the guy and it's a double play. I'm sorry. I'm not going to let him off the hook when he just killed the rally, even though he hit it hard. I like that. That to me is absurd. The same thing in hockey where you have a good quality team, let's say a defense core in either Tampa in their, in their cup years or Vegas, where it's like, 
Good defensemen doing good things. Ah, they're eliminating shots from the high danger. No kidding, because they're good defensemen and they're doing their job. It's just low-hanging fruit. You got a real talented offensive team. Their zone entries are fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Mm. their zone entries. It's because they're good players and they're smart and they carry the puck and they have the puck. I feel right. like you're talking Low to the wrong person with me. No, of course. And that's listen, you guys are basically a, saying you don't want more information. Well, do you agree with, with what this is what JP said? He said and he was adamant there. He was getting emotional. He thinks they're ruining baseball because of the of the, the, the guys, the people in charge that get to operate franchises have decided that they're going with openers and they're not letting starters go. I deep. think what ruins baseball is like a situation we saw with the Jays last year. Mm-hmm where their pitchers are rolling along and it's like, nope, we're taking them out. We have a plan and we are over managing. We're over like we're playing marionette and like every ah. team in the league does that though. And that that's the point is that it's a separate conversation when you're trying to maybe dumb it down or, or speak to the masses and allow people to be included in the conversation. And I think baseball is a great example of that for the longest time growing up. I'm sure you guys were the same thing. RBI was a stat that everyone used. And what it meant was, wow, that's a really good player. Yeah. Now it's ridiculed by a lot of, you know, analytics and sabermetrics people because, and I understand the reasoning behind it. You can't control who's on base, when they're on base, the situation. There's a lot of different things that go into it. But for a hundred years, that was a, a, an easy water cooler talking point. And it's been crushed because now the, you know, the, the, Carriers of the game have determined that it's an irre- irrelevant well, stat. Well, now there's no easy stat, right? Right. It's nothing wins but and Jonas, losses. Don't you think some of them are low hanging fruit? Or it's like if you get talented, to good teams that do good things, it's like you don't need to go to these zone exits, zone entries, high danger, for and against. It's like that's just what good teams do. Yeah, but if you're trying to like explain something, it's just mm-hmm. more information. Like you need to be able to kind of back it up. Like I can't just say, back it up with what you got a bad with, team that doesn't know how to check and they don't know how to finish in their own zone and play defense. Then they're going to have high danger zone chances, a lot of zone entries against a lot of odd man rushes. I don't know. It just it's seems just like low hanging fruit, proof, to me. right? It's just mm-hmm. proof. Like if I got to write an article and say, this is a really bad defensive team, I should have some numbers that say why, instead of just, well, I see, I guess I could just say, well, the puck is going in the net a lot, right? Uh, you could you could come up with the numbers, Jonas, but I'll give you the three defensemen that go out on the ice on a consistent basis that are constantly giving up opportunities, making poor decisions. They either don't move well enough, they don't pass it well enough, or their decision making is not good enough. And right. that's why all those number things are coming up. I agree. <laughs> well, but again, you're, yeah, and it's right. not your job to promote the sport. No. Like what no. JP is saying is that the in baseball, the GMs in baseball – have completely changed the way the game's played yeah. based on the numbers, the statistics, the yeah. data. And it's just been, it's completely taken over to the point where now for a lot of people, baseball is not recognizable because it was somewhat simplified while we were growing up. It was the starting pitchers there. He's probably going seven or eight, maybe nine innings. Then the closer could come in and it's, you try to hit home runs, steal some bases. Like that was kind of, that was baseball. There was action. And and now because of the information, and I we all understand why they did it, because it was beneficial to wins and losses. But now when everyone's playing from the same, same you know, level effectively, because everyone has the, there's no cutting edge anymore for the most part. Every team is kind of cookie cutter and they all operate the same way. And as a result, a lot of the bigger than life personalities and what made baseball very engaging and entertaining is in large part been ripped away. But you don't think it's been improved with the pitch clock and some of the changes? I think that, like I that's, think that's baseball. That's the commissioner saying we got to take it out of the, the man. The GMs have done this to us. And we've allowed it. So we got to change this. We, we can't allow five pitching changes in an inning. Yeah. You know, you can't allow that kind of stuff. Cause so they're like, we have to take things away. We have to take cookies away from you where you can't, you can't make that many changes Guys got to go in for a certain amount of batters or a clean inning. Uh, we need to we need to expand the bases because stolen bases have got to come back. Because again, it's like well, we need action. And, and and listen, I understand why. Again, you look at the numbers and say it's not smart to steal there. But 30 years ago, it was like that guy might go, and this is going to be wild. And if you're in the entertainment business, wild is always better than safe and predictable. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's that's. 
And I, I understand how difficult it is because if I'm a GM, I care about winning. That's what I care about. But if I'm the commissioner, if I'm in the marketing department, I care about our fans. I care about the people that engage in our business. And I think what's happened in pro sports is the last 20 years, the GMs have, have taken over and driven their sport in a certain way that is very self-serving, very understandable, but the commissioners and the owners have allowed it to get carried away, and it's time to get ripped back a little bit. I think it should come back. What would that look like? Well, I mean, with baseball, I don't – got to force teams to allow – pitchers to go deep. I don't know how you do that anymore. You know, I don't, I don't know how you tell guys not to try to throw 97, 98 every single time they're on the mound. I mean, I don't know how you put that horse back into the barn. Why did that become so important? Because the evolution of the hitting, like, what, I think they've shown they, that every Greg Maddox, the way he used to play. Oh, he's like the he's, outlier. Yeah. He, well, but like, I think they say like statistically, Jeff, like every mile per hour up you go, the batting average goes down and down and down and down. So the incentive for the pitcher is like, if I throw 98, I'm going to get paid. Like, right, because that's course. more valuable to well, team. He's not the outlier Jonas. That Zito guy from not too that's long a good ago. Example. Yeah, Zito. Lefty. Yeah. Well, Kershaw is an Barry example. Zito. Kershaw it's doesn't Barry Zito, you. right? It's Barry Zito. Barry yeah. Zito, yeah. Barry Zito used to just throw hanging curves, and he, yeah. he was dialed in. Yeah. It's like not everyone was chucking heat. No, it's a good point. No, and and – but again, because of the opener, the, the what what the way teams are now set up is give me a guy who can throw heat for three or four innings, and then I'll bring in a guy who can throw heat for an inning, yes. and then another guy who can throw heat, and it's just heat, 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 heat. And if they get it, they get it. And if they get it, it's probably going out of the park. <clears throat> and it just it's home runs and strikeouts and Well, and the worst example, remember Blake Snell in the World Series? Or I think he had an he had maybe a no hitter. I yeah, can't remember. Was it was a close perfect to it. game. You're right. And they, I think they, they took him out him. after like five innings, they six did. innings. I think it was less than that. Jonas. JP's bang on on one thing. I was in New York City walking around with some buddies, and word got out that Rocket Clemens was going to be on the mound, and he was going for some. Yeah. It was either strikeouts or wins or something, and we were like, Clemens on the mound at Yankee Stadium, gotta go. Yeah. There's not a lot of that going on anymore. While well, you're gonna yeah. go watch a guy. First inning, dude. No thanks. Well, that's it. The marketing of the starting pitcher yes. was always the main squeeze for any event. Yes. Now it's not even like what the pitching duel is. It's yeah, relevant. You're but underselling it's not. it. There's still guys. Like, they're yeah, there are guys. Hurt. They're getting hurt now. but Yeah, no. They're, You'd uh, be lucky to come up with a 10-pack of guys that would get you to New York City to go watch them start a game. I'll tell you that. And think you're getting seven, eight, nine innings. That's a good point. I mean, 10, 10 pitchers that people actually know. Well, and, and furthermore, again, 10 guys, you think the, they have a real chance of going seven innings, seven Let strong. Let me see if I can come up with them. I'll right. tell you the one dude, another one who was the top of the list was, I caught him in New York was DeGrom. I watched that yes. guy pitch live. Yeah. That Stud. was disgusting, man. But he hasn't been healthy in years. No kidding. Who knows what he ever does again? Yeah. He's got a World Series ring, though. Yeah, as a Ranger. I didn't see that one coming. Um, all right, Bruce Boudreaux in studio. Least Devils tonight. His take on Matthews chasing 70, what he makes of a number of things around the league. We'll catch up with Bruce. He'll join us next. All right, Best Bets brought to you by FanDuel later in the hour. Brian Hazy, dog Jeff O'Neill, Jonas Siegel in here, and here's Bruce Boudreaux. Bruce, have you recovered from WrestleMania? Hey, you know what? I watched all <laughs> eight hours of the stupid thing. It was, was, it was it good? good. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs> Did the what rock... was your favorite part, Brucey? <laughs> what was my favorite part? Like, you know what? I'm a Kevin Owens fan. Yeah. So I was really mad when he when he lost. I wanted to get in there, even though I know it's scripted. I, right. I know all that we stuff. Understand I that. thought the rock on the, the first night was really good. Um and yeah, you know, okay. It's just entertaining. Like, I mean, it keeps me from talking to the wife for four hours and <laughs> <laughs> go watch some wrestling. I go and do to my thing. little my little man cave and I just sit there and don't right. bother me. Yeah. I like it because it's been a two day event now for a few years, I guess. Right? Like, is it because I, like I I haven't watched wrestling in a long time, but I was at WrestleMania six and that was just a one off at the dome. This is like a it's a four day event now. They have the Hall of Fame yeah. thing four the night before. Event. Then they have two days. Of wrestling, then they have Monday Night Raw. Oh, in which the was same in spot. Philly at the at the is it still the Spectrum? Wells no, Fargo. I, Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. And so I mean, they got four days, and I wow. think the attendance was like almost two hundred thousand for the four days. It's 
pretty cool. It's like the NFL draft. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. It's WrestleMania. Um, so we got Leafs Devils tonight. And, you know, we were discussing from a couple of nights ago, and I'm curious to get your take on this as, as the coach. Empty net, Matthew's not on the ice. Like, can you reason with that from Sheldon's perspective? Or were you watching saying, get him on the ice, Chasing please? Chasing 70. Come on now. Well, you know what? Uh, I I can only speak for myself. I think he's trying to say, okay, listen, 70's not that important. You know, it's important for him, but we're team first. But there's not an empty net. He, uh, in the world where Kucherov's not on the ice. And even if, even if there's a penalty and the goalie comes off, Kucherov, is, if he's not on, is the guy that's going on. Right. So, I mean, I think in this situation, um, you know, Matthews could have been on, but who might argue with him uh, with Sheldon? He's, uh, you know. They're playing pretty well. Winning, and the team is playing really well. I think the team is being really underrated right now because every time – uh, you talk about any anybody and you're saying, well, they're gonna, you know, they'll lose in Florida to Florida or they'll mm-hmm. lose lose to Boston. And I don't, I think this is a different team. I think they play way more physical in their own zone. I think Kamsanov or uh, or has been playing incredibly well mm-hmm. since he was uh, banished. Yes. And uh, and I think the the biggest thing to me that I look at as a coach, quite frankly, is is time on ice. And they're not playing Matthews 24 minutes, 23 minutes. And, and the, the fourth line and the third line are really contributing. So, I mean, that's what you need to win in the playoffs. So I think this is their best year as a good crack at it. Really? Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's their history that always has the general public stopping, right? Yeah. It's like people don't want to look foolish and say, I believe in them. And then if they lose again, you're like, oh, I've, how did They've I not learn it. from yeah. this? They've earned that reputation. But I think you're right. Like, for the last 28 to 30 games, they've won more games than any other team in the league. Mm-hmm. They score more goals than anyone else in the league. Um, I I do feel like they've got a different vibe over. You've been preaching that for weeks now, that they have a different feel. They're more physical. They've got some ingredients that they haven't had in the past. And, you know, if you take out the history and you were just starting today and looking forward, why can't they beat anybody in the East in a seven-game series? There's no reason that it can't happen. And not only is there no reason... Anytime they play a, a team from the East, it doesn't matter who it is. They're either winning or they're losing uh, by one goal in the third period, other than the 4-1 to one Tampa game. Mm-hmm. Okay, so which made everybody think again, uh-oh, well, Tampa's, you know, Tampa's got their number. They're going to beat them. But I, I just think I watch uh, almost all their games, and uh, I just think, it, like you guys think, it's a, it's a different vibe for me yeah. the, on this team this year. I think they're defiant almost. Uh, that they're not going to let negative things uh, creep in, and they're going to play. They're going to play to win, and which they always do. But mm-hmm. I think they got a good chance at it this year. Brucey, you mentioned two different things in your last comment. One was Samsonov, and the other was Matthews. Matthews and the star players, or Samsonov. What would be more of an important element come playoff time? The goaltending or the star players showing up? Well, I mean, it's pretty hard to split those hairs, but I mean, any team that wants to win at all has to have good goaltending and nice. a great goaltending. And uh, um, they've had the star players that haven't done well, but it's always, we always end up complaining about the goaltending in, in Toronto. And uh, I think uh, anytime a team wins the Stanley Cup, the goalie's always in the mix for the Vezna, or for the Conn Smythe. So, I mean, I think that has to happen. If you can get that kind of goaltending on any of those top teams, you've got a better chance of winning. Because I think, you know, when you're playing a seven-game series, it's it, it's not easy to stop the top stars, mm-hmm. but it's you're more focused on stopping the top stars in every game. Like, the team is playing, as a rule, better defensively, and they're more, uh, you know, they're more in tune with it's not um, uh, fire wagon hockey type thing. So, I mean... I think the goaltending to me is the is the most important thing. Yeah. Well, Bruce, we talk about the stars. Do you like the idea of having Mitch Marner not play with Austin Matthews, or do you think they just end up going back to that? I think you know. I mean, uh, if things don't go well, they'll go back to it. But I mean, if working they, pretty well right now, yeah, isn't it? Domi and Bertuzzi with him. Yeah, and you, well, you're getting the best out of Domi and Bertuzzi. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, you've put them on the third line earlier on in the year and that they you you can see the production the production now is is really stepped up and that's not to say um martyr's gonna always set 
anybody up. He could have Al Arbor on his left wing, and he'd be <laughs> setting him up at this point. But, I mean, uh, and, you know, Tavares is, is sort of getting the role as the third third line center and enjoying it. So, I mean, and, and I love the balance now. I, I just like when when – they're playing Austin 18, 19 minutes and and 19. And nobody's playing 20 minutes as the top dog. Um, then uh, I think that that balance, that's how Vegas mm-hmm. won it last year. If you look mm-hmm. at all their ice times and everything. Yeah. So anybody can play against anybody. I think it's really good. With Bruce Boudreaux, um, obviously Keith's aware of what Matthews is chasing. I'm sure he's aware of what Nylander's chasing. He's still, I think, four points off yeah, 100. Yeah. Kucherov chasing 100 assists. McDavid, if he plays, chasing 100 assists. As a coach, like, are you aware of a lot of the statistical things that are ongoing? Like a guy chasing a career number, like 70, you can't miss. But if some guy's chasing 25 for a career high, would you be aware of that? I'm. I when it came to statistics I, like that, I'm aware of all of them. Okay. And uh, uh, I know what goals are. Like even years ago, I mean, when they were allowed to have bonuses, mm-hmm. I would be asking. You have bonus for this or that, and because uh, um, you want to get the players uh, the bonuses if sure. you can. But I remember, like um, when I was last in Vancouver, uh, the last year that I finished there, uh, Miller had 98 points going into l- the last game, and uh, um, he got a point in the first period. And we did everything that we could to to get him to score uh, one more point. He he ended up playing 25-55 in the game. And uh, and he didn't get it, but uh, uh, you're so aware of it, and you're aware of how much it means to these guys, even if they don't want to say it out loud. Mm. So I mean, and you know, you if you do it for them, they'll probably go to bat for you for one one time or another too. So it's a it's a good uh, quid pro quo, I think. Brucey, where are you at with the coach of the year? What would your what would Ooh. your vote be? Here, you know where my vote would be. Um, would be if Edmonton ends up in first place. Oh, uh, it would be it would be Knobloch. Knobloch. Because, really? I mean, uh, well, that's how I won it because mm-hmm. I took over and then we ended up winning the division. And like what he did was, you know, I mean, his incredible. record. He's incredible. I mean, the team was in second last place, and all of a sudden uh, they go on a run and they're playing lights out. Watching that game the other night when they played Vegas, where I'm a huge Vegas. Uh, staunch supporter i'm saying they they just sort of dismantled them it wasn't even wasn't even a close game and and if they can play like that with the balance that they're showing i mean uh, i would give it to knoblock i mean i, I think talk in the running mm-hmm. um uh, i think um uh, andrew brunette's in the running. yes absolutely you know Nashville. i mean uh, i think uh if this was a month and a half ago i would have said torts would have been, a, <laughs> yeah, been in the running anymore. but i don't think so anymore no. so i mean uh there's a lot of coaches that do a lot of uh, great, uh, a, a lot of jobs that that people don't don't realize how mm-hmm. good a job they've done. But uh, the voters, to me, usually go with the team that they don't expect to win, yeah. and they win, and then they take it like that. Like Jim Montgomery, I think, has done an incredible job this year. I think he's doing better this year than he did last yeah. year. Yeah, I mean, they've got less players. Look how many players they lost through free agency. Yeah. And to keep uh, to stay in first place in that uh, Atlantic Division is is pretty tough job to do oh, you know, on a repeat because you got the you're sending the same message right. to all the players. So sometimes it goes in one ear and out the other after a while. But he's kept that on point. So I think he's done a great job. I agree. Like you consider the Leafs, Florida, Tampa in the same division, they're going to win that two years in a row. Mm-hmm. Lose your top two centers. Exactly. You and, know. Brucey, you, know, you mentioned Torts. Uh-oh. Their goaltending is horrendous. <laughs> well, it's like, worse, you can't it's, deny it. You it's can't worse deny than, it. It's worse than horrendous. Yeah, it's okay. as bad as it gets yeah. in the league right now. Is there? Is that the only thing? I mean, you, I just mentioned it. You can't win without goaltending. But do you think the scratching of Couturier, and I know you don't want to trash talk one of your colleagues and another head coach, but do you think the comments, the Couturier, what, do you think there's any kind of ripple effect there? Well, I mean, it, to me... And I'll give you my honest opinion, uh, and I like Torts. I think he's done an amazing job in the potential Hall of Fame coach with the Stanley Cup and two Jack Adams and everything else. But, I mean, to, strat, uh, to scratch Couturier, okay, that's fine. You bring him in. He's your, you just named him captain. He said, I'm going to do this. we got to jolt the team. We, they had been losing, and they ended up winning that game. 
but then to scratch him the next game, then you lose him, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, to scratch one game, the guy will say, okay, I don't like this, but I'll do it for the team. I'll say all the right stuff and everything else. Then you scratch him the next game. Then uh, you lose uh, a couple in a row, and then you throw it on the goaltending. Then you actually have a great game, and you lose to the Islanders. This is the one that got me because I watched that game, and both teams are vying for a playoffs. They're both playing hard. And when, the, and when the Flyers tied it up with nine seconds to go, the bench was, like, ecstatic, jumping like they'd won the Stanley Cup, and the players on the ice were like that. And then to come in and say, ah, you know, we had one player going, mm-hmm. boy, that's a deflating thing when you're trying your butt off. And yeah. I think that's the then the next two games they have been really – Oh, it's been a mess really since then. messy since then. Yeah, ever since – yeah, you said it was an embarrassment in the second period and soft and – Guys just don't have it. Like, he just went off. Well, if, I don't know uh, if you guys remember in 1981, Orville Tessier used to be the coach of the Hawks. Mm-hmm. And he he came and he said, our team has no heart. And as soon as he said that, a week later, and if you knew the Blackhawks at that time, they did. They were a really good team. Then uh, um, he got let go because the team said, I'm not playing for him. Yeah, and, forget it. And mm-hmm. so that's what just keeps going through my mind because I was in the Hawks system sort of back then. and. And remembered it well. Yeah. We wasn't talking about you, I hope. No, I was in Moncton. Okay. Well, he good. wasn't talking about me. Yeah, so you're an Islander. Islander yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're an Islander. Yeah. Moncton, Moncton uh, New Brunswick, the home of the Islanders. Bruce, I was curious. If Pittsburgh does manage to get in, would they scare you at all? Like if you're New York, do they scare you just with how they've been playing? I think any team that gets in uh, scares me. Like, I mean, the, half the team gets it, half the league gets in, half the team doesn't get in. I mean, um, uh, New York, it would if I was New York, yeah, they lost the year before in the first round when they should have won mm-hmm. against Jersey. Pittsburgh has got the name guys, you know, like that are mm-hmm. finally the last nine games have started to play. Um, so, I mean, uh, that would scare me. If Pittsburgh, their their goaltending and defense has been good, pretty, pretty consistently good all year. It's their scoring and their power play that hasn't been good. Their power play is uh, awful. Yeah, now they're starting to get, Malkin's starting to score, Crosby's starting to score. You know, has been scoring all year, but I mean, they're getting they're they're getting even the third and fourth line chipping in for the odd goal. I would be scared if I was any team that played Pittsburgh because now they're in and they've got the name presence to be good. Right. So I'd be scared. Well, it's great to see you, Bruce. We appreciate you doing this. I know you're fighting traffic out there, which I mean, you've lived here your whole life. You're not surprised by that. No, I'm sure, no, but not surprised. I just don't like the. The length of the lights when you're waiting. Yeah, it's completely <laughs> uncalled for. We need to get to the bottom of this quickly. Uh, great seeing you, and we'll do it again soon. I hope so. Yeah. All right, sounds good. There's uh, Bruce Boudreau joining us. Leafs Devils tonight. We'll come back and tee that up and get to our best bets. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2. All right, today's best bets are brought to you by and powered by FanDuel. Make your picks and assemble a same-game parlay in seconds on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Austin Matthews, anytime goal scorer. I'm on it. He scores every single night. Jersey, he loves to play Jersey. Dude, I he could go nuts tonight. I, I thought he was going to go nuts the last time, but he could mm. go bonkers tonight and yeah. do something goofy. It does feel like they're going to crush New Jersey tonight. Yeah. Like, it just has a feeling. Like, Jersey has their U-Hauls packed. They just want to get out of here. Yeah. And the Leafs could crush them tonight. I like Matthews' anytime goal score. Matthews, five-plus goals, uh, shots on goal. And a yes goal in the first 10 minutes. There's your parlay for tonight. The best bets powered by FanDuel. Download the FanDuel Sportsbook app today and find thousands of ways to play. Please play responsibly. 19 plus physically located in Ontario. Uh, Round one of the Masters is continuing. I have to say, Tiger Woods looks so butter on that golf course. He just slung one around the corner on 10 with a club twirl. He looks sick. And he's one under through nine. I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm I'm pulling for the guy. I love Tiger. Oh, you're always calling him out. I'm not you're always calling burying him out. the Get guy. To, I'm not buried. Get to 13. Get to 13 at one under, and then make a birdie, yeah. birdie 15, and get it home at three under. Well, that, then we're maybe talking. Do you think if he could pick us? Let, let's say he has to stop. He's not going to finish the the back nine. Do you think he wants to get through 12 and start tomorrow on 13? Would you want to yes. start there? Sure, because you can just hammer a driver around the corner, yeah. and it's a great way to start around. You do not want to start 12. 
That's a disaster. Dude, the first no. shot of the day. Oh, he just hates that shot. Yeah, yeah he just, that's gusty on 12. You don't want to start there. No. He just pushed one into the right side bunker. He's short-sided. He's probably going to give up a stroke here. Just pumped his tires, Jonas. Jinxed it. Yeah, jinxed it. Anyway, Tiger's out there. Corey Connors, 200 today. Our boy. Your guy. You just keep My pumping boy. that one. I'm going to see him tomorrow. I'll oh, yeah, what about your boy, Decky? What did he do today? Decky didn't have fun. Decky was not good. Like, there's no I know way what to you put did, it. too. You were watching the Golf Channel, and Chambly said, Decky is on fire right yeah. now. And it got your ears up, and you were like, oh, Decky? I loved I love this game I coming in. I know you in. love him. He's four over. I love Decky. But anywho, all right, I'm off to uh, Augusta National. Enjoy. Yes, I'll have if a full report If you see Gary Player Monday. there, tell him to cut the crap with that, <laughs> that leg kick. I, never again. The karate again. kick. I, it's got to stop, but it won't. Stop it. His son was push-ups. stealing golf balls a couple of years ago. Yeah, He's doing the leg kick. You're not allowed back. I'll find him. I'll have a word with him. Okay? Stop and chat with him and Greg Norman. <laughs> Full report on Monday. All right. Thanks to everyone behind the scenes. We uh, appreciate you helping out. Jonas, good seeing you. Thanks, boys. Jonas Siegel of The Athletic. Thanks to uh, everyone for tuning in. TV, radio, podcast, web. We appreciate that. We're out of here. Enjoy your evenings. Enjoy the games tonight. We're back tomorrow at... Pack your golf shoes and your range finder. 4 p.m. Bringing a golf glove, too. We'll chat. <laughs> Dang.